Hello, good day. Uh, this is Dr. Bulado. I'm going to talk about the medieval period. Now, we have already tackled a topic on... We have already tackled a topic on the early Middle Ages. And now we proceed with the high Middle Ages. Now, let me first discuss about the daily life of the peasantry. Now, from the readings that I have given to you, uh, we all know that peasant women occupied both an important and a difficult position in manorial society. There were actually a lot of expectations from them. But here are two. The first one is to carry and bear their children, motherhood, so to speak. And the second one is that they were also obligated to work in the fields or to do labor in the fields. So this was their uh, responsibilities or duties. Now the peasant diet during this time was simply bread with supplementary vegetables which they planted in their farms. Now the nobility during the Middle Ages, they were also otherwise known as the aristocracy. Now we all know that Europe was dominated by men whose main concern was warfare. The men of war were the lords and vassals of medieval society. The lords would consist of kings, dukes, counts, barons, and viscounts. People, these people had extensive land holdings and political influence. Now, the aristocracy would also mean a uh, nobility of people who held real political, economic, and social power. So there were quite a lot of aristocrats uh, in medieval Europe, although not as much as the peasants living during that time. Now, the aristocrats can be likened to the, the landed elites or the political elites at present here in the, the Philippines. Now, most women, even aristocratic ones, remained under the control of men. Uh, their fathers until they married, and their husbands after that. So Europe was a very patriarchal society during the medieval period. Now, medieval Europe was an overwhelmingly agrarian society. Just like the civilizations during the, uh, the early civilizations in world history, Europe likewise during the medieval period was, agrarian, uh, was an agrarian society. Its main source of living was agriculture. Most people lived in small villages, but this would change later on with the emergence of towns and cities. Now, the 11th to the 12th century are considered as part of the High Middle Ages. And there were three characteristics of this period. One, revival of trade. Second one, emergence of specialized craftspeople and artisans. And the third one is the growth and development of towns. This I will discuss uh, as we progress later on. So for the revival of trade, uh, this was actually a gradual process. It started in northern Italy. Cities in northern Italy took the lead of the revival of trade. And in northern Europe, it was actually the city of Flanders, which is now located in modern-day Belgium, which also took the lead in uh, the trade. Uh, in Flanders, merchants from England, Scandinavia, France, and Germany converged in that area or in that town to trade their goods for woolen cloth. By the 12th century, a regular exchange of goods had developed between Flanders and Italy. Now, as trade increased, both gold and silver came to be in demand at fairs and trading markets of all kinds. Eventually, a money economy began to emerge, which led to the rise of what we now call as commercial capitalism, which is an economic system in which people invested in trade and goods in order to make profits. And this is what we have today at present. Now, trade outside Europe also existed. Italian merchants were the ones responsible for this, and they became more daring in conducting trade and were the ones responsible for establishing trade in posts 
in different parts outside Europe like Cairo, which is in Egypt, Damascus, which is in Syria, and a number of black seaports where they acquired goods that were not or cannot be acquired in Europe, which will include spices, silks, jewelry, dye stuffs, and other goods brought by Muslim merchants from India, China, and Southeast Asia. Now, eventually in the 13th century, the Mongol Empire expanded and it opened the door to Italian merchants in the markets of Central Asia, India, and China. This also led to the development of trade with the opening of the Mongol Empire. Now, Crusader states later on in Syria and Palestine became very favorable to the Italian merchants in the 12th and 13th century. The Crusades started late in the latter half, latter years of the 11th century. That was the start of the first crusade. It was 1096, if I'm not mistaken. So this was after the crusaders established settlements in what we now call as the region of Palestine, or some would say modern-day Israel. Then that also led to uh, Italian merchants creating settlements there and starting a trade with the people the local people of that area. Now, <clears throat> Crusader states in Syria and Palestine, these were uh, the areas that the Italian merchants focused on. And they were the ones mostly responsible for taking the Crusaders to the east with their ships. <clears throat> Next slide. So eventually, with the towns, there came in the growth of cities. So the revival of trade led to a revival of cities. Towns had experienced a decline in the early Middle Ages, especially in Europe, uh, north of the Alps. With the revival of trade, merchants began to settle in these old cities, followed by craftspeople or artisans, people who on manners or elsewhere had developed skills and now saw an opportunity to ply their trade and make goods that could be sold by merchants. Now, old Roman cities of before eventually came alive as a result. Usually, a group of merchants established a settlement near some fortified stronghold or castles and monasteries. And this is where the city, most of the cities were actually located, beside these fortified strongholds, uh, in order to have uh, easy protection whenever there are invaders that would come. Castles were particularly favored because they were generally located along trade routes. The lords of the castle, as I said earlier, also offered protection. If the settlement prospered and expanded, new walls were built to protect it. Townspeople needed mobility to trade. Consequently, these merchants and artisans, or what we now call as the bourgeoisie, needed their own unique laws to meet their requirements and were willing to pay for them. In many instances, lords and kings saw that they could also make money and were willing to sell to the townspeople the liberties they were beginning to demand, which would include, one, right to bequeath goods sand, sell prop and sell property, two, freedom from any military obligation to the lords, and three, written urban laws that guaranteed their freedom. People were now starting to realize with the growth of the cities, they were now starting to make laws that would give them much more freedom compared to before. As time went on, medieval cities developed their own government for running the affairs of the community. Only males were born, who were born in the city or had lived there for a certain length of time could be citizens. Women were not considered as citizens. In many cities, these citizens elected members of a city council who served as judges and city officials and passed laws. Medieval cities remained relatively small in comparison to either ancient or modern cities. A large trading city would number around 5,000 inhabitants. By 1200, London was the largest city with around 30,000 people. But again, take note, it's not as populated compared to the cities during the ancient times and the cities during the modern times. Uh, if you look at Dumaguete city nowadays, of course, you look, compared it to 1200, London in the 1200, 
then there's a really a very big difference. Now, the recovery and growth of European civilization in the High Middle Ages also affected the state. Although lords and vassals seemed forever mired in endless petty conflicts, some medieval kings inaugurated the process of developing new kinds of monarchical states that were based on, take note, the centralization of power rather than decentralized political order that was characteristic of feudalism or the or of thief holding before. So at this time, uh, the kings were starting to centralize their power. It was not like the feudalistic ages where it was decentralized. So 13th century, from 1200 to 1299, then saw the rise of European monarchs. Let's look at England in the High Middle Ages. By October 14, 1066 AD, an army of heavily armed knights under William of Normandy landed on the coast of England and soundly defeated King Harold and his Anglo-Saxon foot soldiers. That picture right there is King William of Normandy. William then was responsible for the process of combining Anglo-Saxons and Norman institutions to create a new England. He established a strong and centralized monarchy. In the 12th century, the power of English monarchy was greatly enlarged due to the reign of King Henry II. He was particularly successful in the strengthening of royal courts by increasing the number of criminal cases to be tried in the king's court. Many English nobles came to resent the ongoing growth of the king's power. It was becoming too centralized. However, uh, during this time, King Henry was trying to consolidate his power, trying to centralize his power. As a result, uh, there rose in a rebellion during, uh, eventually after King Henry, there rose in a rebellion during the reign of King John. At uh, Runnymede in 1215, John was forced to accept the Magna Carta because the people who rebelled were uh, somehow successful. And John was then forced to accept Magna Carta or the Great Charter, guaranteeing feudal liberties, again, more liberties to the people. Magna Carta gave written recognition to the fact uh, or relationship between king and vassals was based on mutual rights and obligations. This, was, this is what we are referring to. Uh, the Magna Carta gave recognition to that fact, the relationship between king and vassals based on mutual rights and obligations, and was used in later years to support the idea that a monarch's power was limited. It should not, you know, there should always be a limit to a monarch's power. And this was, uh, uh, this was, uh, th this fight was uh, characterized by the Magna Carta. During the reign of Edward I, 1272 to 1307, the English Parliament emerged. In 1295, needing money, Edward I invited two knights from every country and two residents from each town to meet with the Great Council to consent new taxes. And this was considered as the first parliament in England. The English parliament then came to be composed of two knights from every county and two burgesses from every borough, as well as barons and ecclesiastical lords. Eventually, barons and church lords formed the House of Lords, and knights and burgesses composed the House of Commons. The parliament of Edward I approved taxes, discussed politics, passed laws, and handled judicial businesses. The law of the realm was beginning to be determined, not by the king alone, unlike before, the king had a very cent uh, a centralized authority, but start with the creation of the parliament, uh, the law of the realm was now, was now given, the making of those laws was now given to the parliament, not by the king alone. Uh, <clears throat> so this was 
uh, a development, a very welcome development during the high Middle Ages in England. Let's now look at France. Now, in 843 AD, the Carolinian Empire had been divided into three major sections. The Western Frankish lands formed the core of the eventual Kingdom of France. In 987, after the death of the last Carolinian king, the Western Frankish nobles chose Du Capet as the new king, thus establishing the Capetian dynasty of French kings. The Capetians held little real power. In reality, many dukes were considerably more powerful than the Capetian kings. The reign of King Philip II, of August, uh, King Philip II, Augustus, was an important turning point in the growth of the French monarchy. King Philip was the one responsible for uh, expanding the French kingdom by, concert, by conquering English territories in France, which included Normandy, Maine, Anjou, and Aquitaine. Capetian rulers after Philip II continued to add lands to the royal domain. And then Philip IV, the fair, strengthened the French monarchy by reinforcing the royal bureaucracy and the French parliament, uh, which now consisted of three estates. And this, we will reach this part later on when we talk about the French Revolution. These three estates still played a very vital role. The first one is the clergy, the second one was the nobles, and the third one, the townspeople. Then let's proceed to the lands of the Roly Roman Empire. Now, in the 10th century, the powerful dukes of Saxons became kings of Eastern Frankish Kingdom, or Germany as it came to be called. Otto I was crowned by the Pope as Emperor of the Romans in 962, reviving a title that had seldom been used since the time of Charlemagne. Ruled lands from Germany, it was actually Otto I who ruled lands from Germany and Italy. Italy became the center of the Holy Roman Empire, as what Emperor Frederick I envisioned. Now, the Holy Roman Empire, therefore, in the High Middle Ages, consisted primarily of Italy and Germany. Emperor Frederick I's goal was to combine Germany and Italy with his goal of getting chief revenues from Italy, because remember, Italy was a major player in the revival of trade. But he could not do it entirely, as his attempt to conquer Northern Italy was anathema to the Pope and the people from the cities of northern Italy. Frederick II, his successor, envisaged a strong centralized state in Italy, but he also got entangled in a conflict with the Pope, who proved to have been very influential in the northern cities of Italy. The struggle between popes and emperors had dire consequences for the Holy Roman Empire. By spending their time fighting in Italy, the German emperors left Germany in the hands of powerful German lords, who ignored the emperor and created their own independent kingdoms. German Holy Roman Emperor did not have any real power in Italy and Germany. The German lords were even more powerful than them. It was more or less uh, simply just a position. Unlike France and England, neither Ger Germany nor Italy created a centralized national monarchy in the Middle Ages. Both only consisted of many small independent states. Now, the Slavic peoples of Central and Eastern Europe. These people were originally a single people in Central Europe, but they gradually divided into three major groups, Western, Southern, and Eastern Slavs. The Western Slavs in Europe were the Polish and were part of the Polish and Bohemian kingdoms. The German Christian missionaries, however, converted both the Czechs in Bohemia and the Slavs in Poland by the 10th century. They converted them to Roman Catholicism. Magyars in Hungary were also converted to Christianity around this time. The Poles, Czechs, and Hungarians all accepted Catholic or Western Christianity and became closely tied to the Roman Catholic Church. Southern and Eastern Slavs uh, were part of Moravia, 
which converted to Orthodox Christianity of the Byzantine Empire. Some other Southern Slavs were the Croats from Croatia, modern-day Croatia, the Serbs from Serbia, and Bulgarians, of course, from uh, <clears throat> Bulgaria. They also embraced Eastern Orthodoxy. So Western Slavs embraced Roman Catholicism, but Southern and Eastern Slavs embraced uh, Orthodox Christianity uh, by the Byzantine Empire. So Eastern Slavic people were actually from modern Russia and Ukraine. And if you look at their history, they actually encountered Swedish Vikings who moved down the extensive network of rivers into the lands of the Eastern Slavs in search of booty and new trade routes. They were called Ruths by, natives, uh, by native people, thus the origin of the name Russia. So let's now look at the development of Russia. A Viking leader named Oleg, uh, that, uh, from the picture there, settled in Kiev, which is now the capital of Ukraine, at the beginning of the 10th century and created the Rus state known as the Principality of Kiev. His successors extended their control over the Eastern Slavs and expanded their territory until it included the territory between the Baltic and Black Seas and the Danube and the Volga rivers. By marrying Slavic wives, the Viking ruling class was gradually assimilated into the Slavic population. The growth of the Principality of Kiev attracted missionaries, especially the Byzantine Empire. One Rus ruler, Vladimir, married the Byzantine emperor's sister and officially accepted Christianity for himself and his people in 987. From the end of the 10th century, Byzantine Christianity became the model for Russian religious life. Byzantine Christianity is actually Orthodox uh, Christianity. Now, the Kievan Rus state prospered and reached its high point in the first half of the 11th century. Civil wars and new invasions by Asiatic Normans, however, caused, the Ki caused Kiev or the, Kiev, the Principality of Kiev to collapse. And the sack of Kiev by North Russian princes in 1169 eventually brought an end to the first Russian state. The first Russian state had remained closely tied to the Byzantine Empire, which is uh, not the new Europe or not Western Europe. So now let's look at the impact of the Mongols. In the 13th century, the Mongols conquered Russia and cut it off even more from Europe. But they were not numerous enough to settle the vast Russian lands. They occupied only part of Russia and required Russian princes to pay tribute to them. One of the Russian princes was a person named Alexander Nevsky, a prince of Novgorod who became more powerful than the others. His cooperation with the Mongols won him their favor. The Khan leader of the western part of the Mongol Empire rewarded Prince Alexander Nevsky with the title Grand Prince, enabling his descendants to become the princes of Moscow and eventual leaders of Russia. So the, the, event, the eventual leaders of Russia actually come from the lineage of Prince Alexander Nevsky. I'm referring to the monarchs of Russia, not the, the present-day leader, leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin. So, let's now look at the church uh, supremacy, uh, or the papal, the papal monarchy. Now, Christianity was an integral part of the fabric of European society and the consciousness of Europe. The popes of the 12th century did not abandon the reform ideals of Pope Gregory VII but they were more inclined to consolidate their power and build a strong administrative system. During the papacy of Pope Innocent III, the Catholic Church reached the height of its power. Innocent III's actions were those of a man who believed that he, as Pope, was the supreme judge of European affairs, even more powerful than kings and other monarchs. To achieve his political ends, he did not hesitate to use the spiritual weapons at his command, especially what we call as the interdict, 
which forbade priests to dispense sacraments of the church in the hope that the people deprived of the comforts of religion would exert pressure against their ruler. Religion then was used as a political instrument during this time to really show uh, the power of the church, that they are even more powerful than kings and monarchs, pressuring people to pressure their kings and monarchs to do you know, what the church wanted them to do. Now, there was the development of new religious orders and new spiritual ideas also during this time. Between 1050 and 1150, a wave of religious enthusiasm seized Europe, leading to a spectacular growth in the number of monasteries and the emergence of new monastic orders. One of them was the Cistercian Order, which was founded in 1098, and this was the time of the First Crusades, by a group of monks dissatisfied with the moral degeneration and lack of strict discipline at their own Benedictine monastery. There were actually Benedictine monks who just decided to create another religious order. These monks were strict and possessed a single robe apiece and had a very simple diet. The Cistercians played a major role in developing a new activist spiritual model for 12th century Europe. And they really made much emphasis on manual labor and self-sufficiency. Women were also actively involved in the spiritual movement of the age. The number of women joining religious houses were aplenty in the High Middle Ages. Most nuns were from the ranks of the landed aristocracy. Rich women usually went uh, to the, <clears throat> usually became nuns. And most of the learned women of the Middle Ages were nuns. Now, during the 13th century, there emerged two other new religious orders. One was the Franciscans, who lived among the people, preaching repentance and aiding the poor. As, uh, as, they, <clears throat> as they saw that their paragon, their model, and of course the founder, St. Francis uh, of Assisi, was, you know, the life of St. Francis of Assisi was characterized by these like by aiding the poor and by preaching repentance and, you know, the word of God. Their call for a return to the simplicity and poverty of the early church were especially effective and made them very popular among the, the people. So they, they lived frugal and humble lives, the Franciscans. Next. There also came in the 13th century the Dominicans. And they arose out of the desire of a Spanish priest, Dominic de Guzman, to defend church teachings from heresy, which is a belief contrary to official church doctrine. Dominic was an intellectual who came to believe that a new religious order of men who lived lives of poverty but were learned and capable of preaching effectively would best be able to uh, attack heresy. The enemy during this time was heresy or the heretics who uh, believed and said things that were contrary to the official church doctrine. The Dominicans were especially well known for their roles as the inquisitors of the, pap the papal or the papal uh, inquisition. And they were very zealous inquisitors. And uh, they really tried to fight against these uh, heretics. So now let's look at the Papal Inquisition. Now the Holy Office, as the Papal Inquisition was formally called, was a court that had been established by the Church to find and try heretics. The Papal Inquisition is different from the Spanish Inquisition because the Papal Inquisition started earlier. But they had the same goal, and this was to try to find and try heretics. Anyone accused of heresy who refused to confess was still considered guilty and was turned over to the state for execution. During the Spanish Inquisition, they were burned at stake. So to the Christians of the 13th century who believed that there was only one path to salvation, heresy was a crime against God and against humanity. In their minds, force should be used to save souls from damnation. 
So, you know, even if there is a, you know, even if the Lord said that thou shalt not kill because of their, uh, because of their zealous nature, uh, the inquisitors, the priests, uh, and these very religious people tried to use force in order to save, you know, souls from damnation. So, an inquisition, although we'll discuss this later on when we talk about the Spanish inquisition, but the inquis- an inquisition somehow has a very violent nature in it. Now, let's look at the culture of the High Middle Ages. The High Middle Ages was a time of extraordinary intellectual and artistic vitality. It witnessed the birth of the universities and a building spree that left Europe bedecked with churches and cathedrals. This was the time when there were a lot of churches, a lot of universities that were made uh, by by craftsmen, you know, by uh, uh, by by uh, visionaries, by priests who were visionaries, bishops who were visionaries, who had a vision to create these infrastructures. Now, it also witnessed, you know, the creation of universities. Uh, University would refer to, you know, faculty, students, and degrees. The university is a product of the high Middle Ages. It actually comes from the Latin word, uh, universitas, meaning a corporation or guild, and referred to either a corporation of teachers or a corporation of students. The first European university appeared in Bologna, Italy, where a great teacher named Ernerius, who taught Roman law, attracted students from all over Europe. By the end of the Middle Ages, there were 80 universities in Europe, most of them in England, France, Italy, and Germany. Now, when we look at medieval universities, first you have to remember that, of course, it, it all started in the medieval period. Hence, again, given the patriarch, patriarchal nature of society during that time, women were not allowed to become students in these universities. The male students began their studies with the traditional liberal arts curriculum, which consisted of grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Teaching was done via lecture method. Students could not afford books during this time. So teachers read from a basic text, which was very expensive, and then added their explanations later on. No exams were given after a series of lectures. But when a student applied for a degree, he was given a comprehensive oral examination by a committee of teachers. Now, if you look at the first degree to be, uh, to be given, it's, it's known during that time as the Bachelor of Arts, still similar to what we practice today. The second degree to be given is known as the Master of Arts, again similar to what we have today. And then the third degree is the Doctor's Degree, which, if you have this, would enable you to teach uh, the subject that you would want to teach. Or, if not, find other lucrative occupations. Another development during this time was scholasticism. Theology played an important role in the European intellectual world. Theology is the formal study of religion. It was considered as the queen of the sciences in the new universities. The word scholasticism is used to refer to philosophical and theological system of the medieval schools. Now, when we look at scholasticism, you have to understand that in scholasticism, it, it actually tried to reconcile faith and reason, which to some is irreconcilable. But during the medieval period, some priests started to uh, consolidate the ideas of Aristotle and, of course, the teachings of Christianity. So uh, the reconciliation of faith and reason is the main characteristic of scholasticism. And uh, they do this to, demo- to demonstrate that what was accepted on faith was in harmony with what could be learned by reason. Again, to some, combining faith and reason is quite, you know, it's, it's impossible to do this. 
uh, especially later on uh, in the Age of Enlightenment, which we'll discuss as we progress with the topics that we have. So, interestingly, during the medieval period, there was a the development of what we call a scholasticism, which tried to consolidate both faith and reason. So, harmonizing Christian teachings with that of Greek philosopher Aristotle. Now, Aristotle's works threw many theologians into consternation. However, since the former had arrived at his conclusions by rational thought, not by faith, and some of his doctrines contradicted the teaching of the church, but as much as possible, many theologians really tried to rationalize their faith. As you, uh, uh, they, they were trying to rationalize their faith, and this is what we call a scholasticism. One person who tried to do this was Saint Thomas of Saint Thomas Aquinas. Now. He attempted to reconcile Aristotle and the doctrines of Christianity. Aquinas' reputation derives from his masterful attempt to reconcile faith and reason. He took it for granted that there were truths derived by reason and truths derived by faith. He was certain, however, that the two truths could not be in conflict. The natural mind, unaided by faith, could arrive at truths concerning the physical universe. Without the help of God's grace, however, according to Aquinas, reason alone could not grasp spiritual truths, such as the, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or incarnation, uh, that is, Jesus' simultaneous identity as God and human. Eventually, uh, <clears throat> with the developments in Europe, came in, you know, it's the influence among Europeans within Europe started to expand. And this is now our next topic, which is medieval Europe and the world. As Europe developed, uh, as, as Europe developed, European civilization remained largely confined to one geographic area. Some Europeans, especially merchants, had contacts with parts of Asia and Africa, and a few goods from the East found their way into the households of the aristocrats in Europe during the medieval times. The Vikings even reached as far as Greenland and later on Newfoundland, which is found in North America, although they only created a very small settlement there and did not stay long. At the end of the 11th century, however, Europeans began their first concerted attempt to expand beyond the frontiers of Europe by conquering the land of Palestine which is very relevant today because of what is happening now in Israel. Uh, we will further, we will later on understand why, you know, there is a very deep history to that, especially conflict among Christians and Muslims uh, within the Middle East. And now we look at the conflict between Palestinians and the Israelites. And that conflict, started with the Crusades. It all started with the Crusades. So let's now talk about the first Crusades. Now, the Crusades were based on the idea of a holy war against the infidels or unbelievers. The infidels or the unbelievers were the Muslims during that time. Now, the wrath of the Christians was directed against the Muslims. And at the end of the 11th century, Christian Europe found itself with a glorious opportunity to attack them. It all started when Alexios I, who was a Byzantine emperor, asked Pope Urban II for help against the Seljuk Turks, who were Muslims. It all started there. Pope Urban II a very opportunistic man, you can find him there in the picture, saw this as a golden opportunity to provide papal leadership for a great cause, to rally the warriors of Europe for the liberation of Jerusalem and the Holy Land, which is now modern-day modern day Palestine, from the Muslim infidels. At the Council of Clermont in southern France, near the end of 1095, Pope Urban II challenged Christians to take up their weapons and join in a holy war to recover the Holy Land. Three organized crusading bands of noble warriors, most of them French, then made their way eastward with their 
how would you say it? Uh, their motto? I, I wouldn't say motto, but their, yeah, maybe you can say it like that. Where they, wherein they would proudly say every time, God wills it. That was, you know, that was the maxim among uh, crusaders. God wills it. When Pope Urban II uh, tried to convince them to go uh, to Palestine, one of the nobles who attended uh, that meeting, you know, immediately said, God wills it. And, they, you know, the others repeated those three words. And that eventually became the maxim of the crusaders. God wills it. It's God's will that they would go to Jerusalem and liberate it from the infidels. And remember, they were from France. They were from Western Europe. And this, from the eyes of the Muslims or the, the, the Palestinians during that time, in, in their eyes, that was, you know, an invasion. That was a form of colonization, so to speak, when, where they were kicked away from their house, from their homes, because of this belief among Western Europeans that, they were, you know, uh, fighting for God. So you can see that there is already that history of conflict beginning with the Crusades. Now, after the capture of Antioch in 1098, much of the crusading hosts proceeded down the Palestinian coast, evading the well-defended coastal cities, and reached Jerusalem in June 1099. After a five-week siege, the holy city was taken amid a horrible massacre of the inhabitants, which included men, women, and children. After further conquest of Palestinian lands, the crusaders ignored the wishes of the Byzantine emperor and organized four Latin crusader states. Because the crusader kingdoms were surrounded by Muslim hostile to them, they grew increasingly dependent on the Italian commercial cities for supplies from Europe. Can you just imagine, you know, that place? Israel is surrounded by Arab, you know, Arab states, and even until now. So, because of that, the Crusaders during that time got their goods from Italian merchants. So the Italians were just there. They they were the capitalists. You know, they were the ones who provided with them food in exchange for money, for gold, and whatnot. Now. After the First Crusade came in the succeeding Crusades. Now, some Italian cities, such as Genoa, Pisa, and above all, Venice, became rich and powerful as the Crusades went along. It was not easy for the Crusader kingdoms to maintain themselves. Already by the 1120s, the Muslims had began to strike back. The fall of one of the Latin kingdoms in 1144 led to renewed calls for another crusade, especially from the monastic firebrand St. Bernard of Clairvaux. The Second Crusades turned out as a failure. It was utterly, uh, it, it was just, uh, it was a failure. Uh, the, th the Third Crusade was not so much of a failure compared to the Second Crusade, but it was a reaction to the fall of the Holy City of Jerusalem in 1187 to the Muslim forces of Saladin. Uh, there's actually a movie about this. Uh, I forgot the title of the movie. Uh, but there's actually a, a Hollywood movie about this, uh, The Third Crusade. Uh, let me try to... Yeah, Kingdom of Heaven is the title of the movie. So it's a very good movie about the, the Third Crusades. So... Because of the fall of Jerusalem in 1187, uh, under the Muslim forces of Saladin, the Third Crusades then, you know, was created. And now all of Christendom was ablaze with calls for a, a new crusade after that fall. Now, there were three major monarchs who agreed to lead their forces in person during this crusade. The first one was Emperor Frederick of Frederick Barbarossa of Germany. Second one was Richard I, the Lionhearted of England. Third was Philip II, Augustus, King of France. Some of the Crusaders finally arrived in the East 
this was the third crusade by 1189 only to encounter problems uh the king of the emperor of germany uh, frederick barbarossa drowned while sim swimming in a local river and his army quickly disintegrated there were then two armies left the english and the french and they arrived by sea and met with success against the coastal cities but was met with failure when they moved inland richard then made an agreement with saladin to allow christian pilgrims free access to jerusalem which the very magnanimous saladin uh, agreed so christians could then be able to travel uh, do pilgrimage in in jerusalem and they were given free access by the muslims as a result of this agreement between richard the lionhearted and saladin now there were other crusades that followed after after the death of saladin in 1193 pope innocent iii initiated the fourth crusade on its way to the east the crusading army became involved in a dispute over the succession to the byzantine empire the venetian leaders of the fourth crusade saw an opportunity to neutralize their greatest commercial competitor the byzantine empire venetians uh, they were they come from venice and remember as we what we have discussed before the italians were had a very capitalistic mindset and they saw an opportunity to uh to do something about it especially towards their competitors the byzantine empire diverted to constantinople which is now in modern day turkey the crusaders sacked the great capital of byzantium in 1204 and set up the new latin empire of constantinople not until 1261 did the byzantine army recapture constantinople in the meantime additional crusades were undertaken to reconquer the holy land all of them were largely disasters and by the end of the 13th century the european military effort to recapture palestine was recognized as a complete failure the crusades in a way was a failure and it only created more animosity within that region of the middle east and animosity between christians and muslims and further animosity against uh the jews and now let's look at the effects of the crusades now the crusaders made little long term impact on the middle, middle east where the only visible remnants of their conquests were their castles did the crusades help stabilize european society by removing large numbers of young warriors who would have fought each other in europe this is a very important question asked by historians and some historians would think so and believe that western monarchs established control more easily as a result of the crusades the crusades indubitably contributed to economic growth and that's one thing i can tell you that really was uh that really emerged or it, it was really promoted during that time uh it it contributed to the economic growth of the italian port cities especially genoa pisa and venice the crusades may have enhanced the revival of trade but they certainly did not cause it even without the crusades italian merchants would have pursued new trade contacts with the eastern world so we cannot really fully say that the crusades uh <clears throat> caused the revival of trade no regardless of the crusades the italian merchants would have still found ways to trade with other people outside europe which they have done before uh, with the mongols and you know the other uh, with, with the other asians and the people in the middle east and northern africa the crusades had side effects that would haunt european society for generations one is the widespread attacks on the jews as some christians argued that to undertake holy wars against infidel muslims and you know they they undertook these wars against infidel muslims but you know while the the murderers of christ as they say quote and quote ran free at home it, for them this was unthinkable so this led to anti you know feelings of anti-semitism and it also led to further animosity between christians and muslims and later on we'll we'll talk about that as we proceed to the the next topics so now let's look at the conclusion or concluding remarks 
what different for a parent between the Middle and the Modern Ages? Uh, it's it's important for us to start with this as you know it as a preparation, a prelude to our discussion on the modern times, especially when we talk about the Renaissance period. Now, one, the geographic center of power in the Middle Ages was Europe. The developments that took place in the European countries at the time exerted a tremendous impact on the events in most other parts of the world then. While during the modern ages, there is no single country or region or continent that can be said to have dictated all the events that have taken place in the world. Secondly, in terms of the economy, the main economic activity during the Middle Ages was agriculture. Even if we would say that there was already commercial capitalism, the main economic activity was still agriculture within the context of feudal or the manorial system. In the modern times, the main economic activity shifted to capitalism. During the medieval period, the institution that wielded the greatest influence was the Roman Catholic Church. During the modern times, it was not an institution per se, but the individual was given, you know, was the individual proved to have had, you know, a great influence during modern times with the rise of humanism during the Renaissance period. So, this, these are just some of the differences between middle, the Middle Ages and the Modern Ages. So, eventually, European civilization began, you have to take note again, huh? it began to flourish in the High Middle Ages, 11th, 11th to 12th century AD. The revival of trade, expansion of towns and cities, and the development of money economy did not mean the end of a predominantly rural European society, but they did open the door to new ways to make a living and new opportunities for people to expand and enrich their lives. High Middle Ages led to cultural revival, which then you know, created new centers of learning like universities, the use of reason to systematize theology, scholasticism, and increase the number and sizes of churches. The High Middle Ages witnessed a spiritual renewal that led to a revived papal leadership and new dimensions to the religious life of the clergy and laity. The spiritual renewal, however, also gave rise to crusading holy warriors who killed for God. God wills it, as they would say, thereby creating animosity between Christians and Muslims that still has repercussions to this day. And that ends our discussion for medieval, the medieval age or the, the middle ages or the medieval period. Now, uh, for next meeting, uh, just please prepare for an exam or I might, uh, we'll talk about it next meeting. We'll see whether we'll have an exam or we'll have the exam during uh, the next next meeting but please review this video along with the previous discussion that we had and this will be the, you know all of these things will be uh the coverage for our first chapter exam uh on <clears throat> on on this subject so if you have further questions feel free to comment in google classroom or on the next meeting, feel free to ask me questions during that time if you have further questions. Thank you for listening and have a great day.